All right, what is going on, my friends? I got a whiteboard because I do listen to you sometimes. Uh, I figured I don't know how legible this is going to be. You guys can let me know in the comments whether you can read this. My handwriting is egregious. I know and I apologize. You don't need to tell me. Uh, but regardless, I'll be reading off of this. So even in the off chance, or not the off chance, even in the very possible chance this is completely illegible to you guys, it'll just act as talking points for me. Uh, I'm confident this video is still going to provide a bit of value to a lot of people. Today, we are going to be talking about how to eat to become a muscle man. Uh, what do I mean by being a muscle man? Exactly what it says, big and strong. Uh, I find that having the eating habits of a strong, large person for a prolonged period of time alongside training is what ends up facilitating you becoming something that's very far from what you are right now. If you don't have the habits of what you want to become, you will never become that. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the basic tenets of this. We're going to talk about it in ways that I hope will give uh, those of you who are newer to this some good ideas for what you should be looking to implement within your diet. And those of you who are more advanced, I'm hoping I can throw some things out there that you can just look at your diet like, ah, shit. Uh, I knew this kind of, but I'm not doing it. Maybe I can reevaluate and I can improve. So hopefully I will provide some value to all levels of lifting. One thing I've always liked is this idea that we can do if it fits your macros, but from a select list of foods, right? We want to have a list of foods uh, that A, have a reasonably high micronutrient density for the most part, making sure that we're checking off all of our micros because our body tends to function and adapt to training a hell of a lot better when we have no glaring deficiencies. Uh, and we also want to select an if it fits your macros list of things that we know digest well, because as we get bigger and as we get stronger, we're going to turn into a machine and we're going to be turning through a lot of clean food, right? If we're eating foods uh, that are these higher uh, micronutrient density foods that also digest well on average, we're going to be eating a reasonable quantity of food pretty quickly. So we want that to digest well. So that are the kind of the main criteria. But that being said, if tracking macros is just not something that interests you, you don't really see yourself doing that, or you find it daunting, we can just start to standardize our diet uh, comprised of these foods. So we're going to kind of work our way through my list here. Hopefully this does not fall. Uh, that would be very awkward to have to set this back up mid video, but basically we're going to be looking at somewhere between three and six meals. Uh, I think many of you have heard my talking point that uh, if you are someone who's looking to become big and strong and maximize your performance, I usually recommend that people move to four meals. One of those meals could be kind of a pseudo meal where we have a like a little protein shake and a snack for some carbs, but we should probably move to four uh, feeding windows as it makes uh, eating the amount of protein we want to eat more viable. Now, I just read a comment on the uh, the interview podcast type deal I did with Stan Strength, uh, highlighting some recent meta analyses that uh, kind of suggest that the upper end of useful protein intake maybe is 1.6 grams per kilogram rather than the past purported 2.2, uh, so roughly one pound per, um, roughly one gram per pound, right? It was saying that, okay, maybe the data is suggesting that actually we kind of cap out our benefit below that. Uh, and I am going to tell you this is one of my less evidence-based opinion, but I would speculate uh, that we do know one of the biggest predictors of rate of progression is the difficulty of the training, right? Uh, and I don't think it's entirely unreasonable to speculate uh, that the amount of protein at which we see diminishing returns might differ with differing training intensity. So unless this study was conducted on people that I feel are doing extremely rigorous training routines, I feel maybe it's possible that we see some difference there. Um, and anecdotally for myself and my athletes, I do like leaning more towards that one gram per pound or 2.2 grams per kilogram number. I've just seen a difference in results enough times. I don't want to say, oh, I know better than the science. I don't want to be that guy. But I think that this is somewhere where we're kind of seeing a divergence, maybe in the methodology of the studies and what people are seeing in practical application. Um, that being said, it is what I aim for. Worst case scenario, you just eat some extra uh, meat, which has very solid micronutrient density. That would be my own uh, take on it. You're welcome to disagree. More power to you. I'm just, this isn't an end all be all 
uh, diet guide. This is me explaining how I approach things, right? So uh, to hit the kind of protein we're looking to hit, it's much more practical to do that in four rather than three. So most people need to move to four. Uh, as we, like I said, we ramp up these quant quantities of food, it might become impractical to eat it in four, and then we might need to move to five. I really wouldn't go past six. That's pretty outlier-ish. Um, that's where I hang out, uh, and I don't know too many people that have to eat much more than I do, uh, unless Brian Shaw is watching this for some reason. So usually we're going to want to move to four feeding windows per day because we want to be a big, strong guy. Big, strong guys end up having to eat a lot of food to uh, help them recover from their rigorous training. So that's the first thing we're going to look at. Those of you who are advanced already know this. You already know, oh, well, yeah, I figured out real quick when I was hitting that one gram per pound, that was a pain in the ass to do in three meals. I eat four. Cool. Whatever works best for your schedule. If you can just eat a ton of food, that's a gift you have and you can do it in three and that's convenient for you, go for it. The next thing we're going to talk about is high focus on micros. Like I said, uh, I think that especially with the presence of PEDs um, being a glaring one, right? So if you eat too little fat, it stunts your hormonal production, right? So it can actually lower your testosterone levels if we fall below, let's call it 0.35 grams of fat per pound of body weight. Right uh, After that point, we need some fat to help us with hormonal production. When we fall below that, we might struggle with hormonal uh, production. Those who are on PEDs kind of are getting their testosterone from a bottle. So they can almost get away with a lower fat intake. So that's something to bear in mind. And I've also, uh, like I talked about in the Stand Strength podcast, we could say, okay, well, PEDs seem to have a disproportional effect on size when compared to strength, right? Uh, the other thing that I would speculate is micronutrient deficiency seems to uh, halt people's strength progression more than it halts their size progression. That is to say that I've seen some people uh, get very, very uh, large on what is a, a diet that is very devoid of micronutrients, like that true chicken breast, tilapia, rice, barely any veggies, no fruits style diet, just hitting their macros. I've seen people reach a very high level of muscular development, whereas I have seen anecdotally uh, that it really stunts people's strength progression to not have a more well-balanced diet in terms of checking off all of our micros. And anecdotally, uh, I can vouch for this. I've gone through periods of time where I just hit my macros uh, using these more nutrient-devoid foods because it's easier, uh, and I actually didn't feel I was performing as well in the gym as when I was keeping that micronutrient density concept in mind. Again, this is speculative. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is adherence before optimization. I can tell you what I think are the best options in terms of micronutrient densities, but if you hate that food and you're going to skip out on that meal all the time or uh, you're just not going to follow it, picking something that maybe is slightly less optimal that you're going to adhere to uh, is going to be the best option, right? Adherence is what makes a diet good before optimization, right? A suboptimal diet that we have great adherence to and we can just adjust from there is going to outperform this perfectly written diet that sounds great on paper uh, that, that just doesn't fit with the person's schedule or they hate these foods or they hate cooking this specific item. So we should factor in heavily what allows you to be the most likely to actually follow these. I'm going to tell you some of the stuff that I think is great options, but if your favorite food is not in this chart uh, and you know that you're going to actually eat it, you're going to actually make it and it works pretty well for for you, doesn't matter that it's not here, right? Adherence, or what's uh, what's Stan Efferding's phrase? Compliance is the science. Now, the next one we're going to talk about is just we're doing an if it fits your macros diet. So if you really burn out on chicken one meal, you can swap it to any of the other protein options. You could equate the macros. You could not equate the macros, right? Um, but we need to be selecting from a list of things that we know digest relatively well. So if there's certain things on here that you can't have, just check that off your potential things you can rotate in your diet as you burn out and start to hate things. Because especially as you become a big muscle man, we got to eat a lot of protein all the time. You start getting sick of things. And that's where strategically rotating things is a tool that I would really recommend that you uh, utilize. Now, the next one, salt all your meals to taste. Um, I am just a Stan Efforting parrot uh, for athletes who who are sweating out sodium, uh, the amount of sodium that we should eat goes up, right? The uh, 1.5 grams, 2 grams uh, RDA is for sedentary individuals. That scales differently with athletes who are going to be sweating. And if you're training hard, you're going to be sweating. So we want to probably just salt all our meals to taste. Uh, salt it until you like, really like the taste of it. If it tastes bad, put less salt on it. Uh, yeah, I think that would just be a good habit to have. Now, one thing I always talk about is alongside our salt intake, we want to have a proportional potassium intake, right? Uh, high salt intakes can negatively impact our blood pressure, especially if it's in the absence of sufficient potassium. Now, potassium is an interesting one. 
Lots of other micros, you can say, oh, well, I need this micro, so with meal three, I have cranberry juice. I, with, I need this micro, so I have an orange, right? So it's like, check, 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 I have this item, that item contains 100%. Uh, for potassium, we need at least five grams. Nothing practical is going to contain five grams unless it's an ass load of food. So uh, potassium is a little bit unique. It's almost like a macronutrient, as in to hit our target, we need to space it through the day. Thankfully, we have a couple of options here of things that all have potassium and they can all add up in our meals. And if we're selecting foods that have a high micronutrient density, things that have high micronutrient density also tend to have a good bit of potassium in them as well. So if we select a protein source that has a good micronutrient density, we select a fruit and we select a veggie, we do that across four to five meals, there's a good chance we are hitting our target for potassium. We can easily supplement this by drinking uh, either uh, coconut water or body armors. Um, both contain quite a bit of potassium, a very easy way to run up that potassium number. If you realize that you are coming shy and you're cramping all the time, uh, those are a powerful tool that you have if you cannot get it in nothing but food. Um, we're gonna talk about later potatoes being a powerful weapon if you digest them well for making sure that we check off uh, that potassium marker. Uh, so we're gonna go through just a couple of things and these are the basis of our meals, right? Protein is the building block of muscle. I've told you that I agree with kind of the science prior to these recent findings that we kind of see benefit up to that one gram per pound mark. I, I really do believe that. Uh, maybe I am an idiot. I am a meathead. I've been accused of it many times. It may well be true, but we are going to hit our protein macro. So we have our options that I have put here for how we hit that, right? We're gonna try to space that evenly through the day. Right, let's say we have four meals. On average, we're gonna to look to try to get about the same amount every meal. Maybe you can drop back the amount in the pre-workout window if it just sits in your stomach a little funny and eat that afterward, that's a preference. But on average, we're looking to distribute this roughly evenly within reason, right? So on the top of the list, you could already guess this. I'm a Stan Efforting fanboy. We have beef, bison, lamb, so all ruminoid animals. Uh, they have multiple stomachs. It and basically, long story short, this ends up meaning that these red meats uh, have, I guess lamb, is lamb a red meat? I don't think it technically is, but it's a ruminoid animal and it's got very high micronutrient density. It's very high in B vitamins, it's high in iron, um, and it's got a good little bit of potassium in it as well. So it's just as good for hitting our protein macro as chicken is, as tilapia is, as some of these traditional options and it comes with the added benefit of racking up our micronutrient totals while we're eating our proteins. Um, so I suggest that if red meat digests well for you, it should be at least once a day in my personal opinion. I think that the research out there saying it's potentially carcinogenic is nowhere near conclusive. I wouldn't stress about that too much personally based on my reading of the literature. Um, although it is kind of still up in the air for further research. I, maybe I'll come back and I'll tell you oh, I fucked up and I told you guys to get cancer. Don't do that. Who knows? I doubt that will happen, but uh, moving on, right? That's a staple. Next one is gonna be eggs. Eggs kind of are a protein uh, and a fat source. They are a very complete protein source as in the amino, the amino acid profile is spotless. It is phenomenal, so it is a great protein source. Just as all of these options are, generally speaking, animal proteins tend to have a good amino acid profile, uh, which just means that the protein itself, good, muy bueno, right? Uh, the other thing that's great about eggs is the yolk, right? They're a good fat source. Um, the research on the cholesterol in eggs tends to suggest that it's not really bad for your LDL cholesterol. In fact, there's some research to suggest that it boosts your HDL, so your good cholesterol. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily make that a concern unless you know you're someone who is uh, very sensitive to dietary cholesterol. Uh, and the egg yolk contains basically every single micronutrient, at least some quantity. So just like the red meat, this is a real heavy hitter. Uh, if you stomach, if you don't hate eggs, you digest them okay, uh, this would definitely be a staple. They could definitely rotate because eventually they kind of start to get gross. Uh, salmon and cod, not the most cost friendly, but again, uh, especially in the salmon, a pretty good micronutrient profile, a good fatty acid profile, uh, all around good source if you can afford it. Um, I would definitely say salmon ranks quite high, especially if it's wild caught uh, because the nutrition tends to differ from farm raised salmon uh, versus wild caught salmon. So if you can get one that says line caught, uh, there's even line caught canned salmon that's relatively affordable. If you like that, please go for it. Uh, the next one, the basics, chicken and turkey. 
Uh, I believe turkey has slightly more nutritional value than chicken and chicken thigh has a little bit more nutritional value than chicken breast, although it comes with more fat, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, while they aren't the most dense micronutrient wise, they still do contain micronutrients. We still have plenty of other places we can get a lot of micronutrients. I think eating chicken or turkey for a meal or two a day, uh, just to hit that protein macro, hitting that protein macro is huge. The fact that we're miss if it's very easy for you, you like it, uh, or you can get it down really easy, don't shy away from them. They're great tools to rotate in and out. I just wouldn't get all of your protein from them because we're potentially missing out on some cool benefits. Very expensive, but crab, phenomenal micronutrient density, very tasty. Uh, I don't think many people watching this are gonna be eating crab as a staple of their diet, but if you could, pretty good. Shrimp, a uh, nice little way to mix it up. Um, okay-ish micronutrient density, good option. Um, tilapia slash tuna. Tuna, you have to worry about mercury, even, um, even with the ones that are lower mercury, it's still a concern, but they do have okay micronutrient density. They're very convenient. You don't have to cook it. Uh, and it's a tool that I absolutely, if I'm behind, I don't have any food cooked. I always keep some cans of tuna in my pantry just in case. Uh, so those are a good one. Tilapia, pretty devoid of micronutrients, but again, Sometimes we're just trying to hit that protein macro for the meal. We have some micronutrients coming from other parts of the diet. It's not the end of the world. It can help you keep the diet sustainable uh, and keep yourself adherent, which is key. Um, just gonna touch on pork, generally a bit fatty. Um, I usually lean towards leaner meats uh, as I think there are better fat sources than animal products a lot of the time. Uh, and also because we're trying to keep our digestive mind, having really fatty meats never meshes well with that, but it is a good option. It contains a similar-ish amount of creatine to uh, beef. It is a good option. If you like pork, go for it. And then liver, um, I wouldn't necessarily say this is a real way to run up your protein, but throw, mixing some liver in with your beef uh, is a way to run up a lot of micronutrient density. It's an option. Uh, and then we have the asterisks. We have milk and yogurt, so standard dairy products. Uh, if you digest them well, these are your best friends. Phenomenal micronutrient density, tons of potassium in both of these. The yogurt is a great way to run up your potassium. One of my favorite tricks for running up a potassium is taking just like one cup of orange juice, mixing in some spinach, and mixing in some Greek yogurt, putting it in a blender. It tastes good because it's orange juice based. You can knock it back. Tons of potassium in that easy way to kind of run up that total. Um, if you can't digest them, obviously they're not the best option. That being said, Greek yogurt and I believe Icelandic yogurt have lower lactose uh, than milk or most cheese, uh, which you, it could be worth a try, right? Because lactose intolerance is a spectrum. It's not always just, oh, you are lactose intolerant or you are not. There's different degrees to which people can process lactose. Some people who couldn't just drink a glass of milk without shitting themselves might actually be able to have some Greek yogurt and feel fine. So that could be something you experiment with. Hard cheese also being an option. Easy way to source your calcium. Uh, whey, yeah, kind of what, it's almost in a way, it's kind of like what we said about the tilapia or maybe the chicken. Yes, this does not have a ton of micros, although uh, the chicken does have significantly more micros than uh, whey does. Whey is literally just protein for the most part. It can be a good tool. Like I said, compliance is the science. Uh, if you have a meal that you eat on your break at work and you just couldn't get down solid food, this is a hell of a lot better than getting no protein. Right, so if it allows you to follow a diet consistently, it's a very good tool that you can have at your disposal. Uh, and it also um, is something that is maybe not the best option for digestion, varies from person to person. We could put other protein supplements here. Pea-based protein is solid. Uh, beef and egg derivative proteins are solid. Anything else could fit there. I just put whey for some reason. Uh, bacon, probably not the most healthful meat, but I will say for those who really struggle to put on weight, uh, throwing in some bacon with breakfast is just a really easy strategy to run up total like calories. Now, the other one, I have a, a little question mark next to fat. Uh, and that's basically because depending on our choices in the protein category, we might be getting enough fat already and not need to add in any. So. If you're someone who has suspect digestion, maybe we want to keep our fat relatively low towards that 0.35 grams per pound mark. Maybe we just don't like how fat makes us feel. We don't like how it tastes. Uh, we don't really see any reason to go above that. If we're trying to bulk and we're trying to get in easy calories, running up a fat, if it makes you feel okay, is a good option. Although lots of people prefer how they feel on a little bit lower fat diet, so long as it's sufficient for hormonal production. But if we are choosing really lean protein options, we might come woefully short on our fats. So uh, it's kind of an if-then equation. If we are selecting a protein source that has a reasonable amount of fat that adds up to a reasonable amount of fat across the day, we don't need to supplement 
supplement any additional fat with that meal. Uh, if we are choosing a lean protein source, we also want to select a fat to go alongside of it. Uh, just a couple that I like to use, avocados or avocado oil. Uh, avocado also offers a great amount of micronutrient density. It's a healthful fat, uh, very, very good for you. Uh, olive oil, very good for you. Coconut oil, nuts, nut butter, butter, ghee, uh, all reasonable options, uh, varying in their healthfulness. I really like olive oil and I really like avocados and nuts uh, as they offer additional benefits alongside just being a good fat source that tends to digest quite well for most people. Um, so we have our fat, um, we might have our fat, or I'm sorry, we have our protein checked off, uh, distributed evenly across these meals. We can rotate them when we need to or try to eat this big boy diet of uh, dense nutrients. Uh, we supplement a little bit of fat when needed. Then we are looking to get our carbs in. Uh, carbs is the one time that we might not be assessing uh, solely on micronutrient density. We are probably going to prioritize digestion over all else here because as we become certified muscle men, uh, we are going to need to eat a lot of quantity of carbs. So the ease of digestion starts to really factor in. It's the reason that most big guys favor, even the smart ones, not just the dumb roided meatheads, will favor away from maybe brown rice or quinoa, which are generally considered to be more healthful uh, carb sources to go with a meal because if you ate those in the quantities that you would need to eat them uh, at that size, you would feel horrendous. So we're looking at rice um, is the standard for a reason. It digests quite well. It's easy to get down. Um, all around pretty good. People will worry about the high glycemic index of rice. Uh, the American Diabetic Association has kind of disbanded the use of the glycemic index as originally written because it assumes that you're eating nothing but that carb source, which is almost never the case. If we are eating fats and proteins, it slows down that digestion and those numbers associated with the glycemic index kind of go out the window. So because we are always eating a fat source, a protein source uh, with these carbs, the fact that it's a relatively high glycemic index does not matter. Um, we got rice, we got cream of rice. The reason lots of bodybuilders like cream of rice is it just lends itself to an entirely different flavor profile than what you can do with rice. You're kind of stuck with like salty, some sauces, some spices, but we can go like real sweet with cream of rice and it's pretty practical. Uh, it can break up the monotony of the day to have a meal that goes with more of like a chocolatey, peanut buttery profile uh, as far as how it tastes. So digest as well as rice. It's basically granulated rice. So uh, it digests even quicker than rice probably. Uh, we have sa sourdough, if we're going to eat a bread, generally sourdough is the move. Um, I believe it is prebiotic, probiotic, something like that. Uh, all around, I think it sits better in the stomach than eating a lot of any other kind of bread. Um, I'm a big advocate for sourdough. If you want to run up some carbs with breakfast, you don't feel like eating rice with breakfast, I will always advocate for that. Next one, we have sweet potatoes and potatoes. Uh, these maybe could have an asterisk on them because some people uh, couldn't digest these very well in high quantities, so it might not be the staple, right? Uh, it's cool because of our options. This is the only one that has really significant micronutrient density and especially potassium. Uh, using some potatoes with each meal uh, runs up your potassium really quickly if it's something that digests well for you. There's a reason it's kind of the archetype is like steak and potatoes because uh, that is a very nutritious meal, if nothing else. Uh, one thing you can do is if you want to get uh, potatoes into a meal, but it would probably sit way too heavy in your stomach if you got all of your carbs from potatoes. Is I really, really like what Stan Efferton does with the vertical diet nowadays, which is it will be rice, it will be ground beef or steak, and then also potato mixed into the Monster Mash with some bone broth. Um, so we're getting some of our carbs from rice and some of them from potato. It doesn't have to be one or the other. That way we kind of reap the benefits of both, where we got the ease of digestion of the rice and just using a bit of the potato to gain some of those benefits in running up our potassium. Um, both are really good options. Cereal as something just, again, sweeter taste profile, tends to digest quite well for most people. You could just mix your way uh, with some fair life or something, put it on some cereal very quick, very easy, and very uh, easy to be consistent with meal to have after you work out or for breakfast or something. Uh, that's more of like a convenience option, obviously. Uh, the last two we're gonna talk about are pasta and oats. Uh, both are perfectly valid. Uh, they have asterisks because of the variability in digestion there. So you have to kind of assess that for yourself. 
Now, the next thing we're going to look at is we want to probably, so we say, okay, we got a protein source, we got a fat source, we got a carb source. This is pretty standard dieting, right? We have these four meals and we can kind of rotate like, oh, meal one, I have eggs, but I finally got tired of the eggs. So I'm just going to start having steak for breakfast or something like that. We can kind of rotate these with time. We have our quantities. Uh, if, if you really want to avoid using macros, you could just go by weight of food and not worry about the macros and just say, oh, I'm trying to be a big guy, so I eat six ounces of whatever meat with each meal. And then you're like, oh, I feel like I need to bump that up. I eat seven ounces of meat with each meal. Uh, and you could uh, kind of approach that that way. You could look at it like, okay, well, I'm eating about a fist size serving. I'm trying to get bigger. I'll add a little bit to that. Uh, consistency is key here uh, before we really try to optimize this. Now, I like including a bit of fruit with each meal. I find it boosts energy levels quite a bit. Uh, the fructose space through the day tends to have a positive stimulatory effect in the liver. Um, so energy levels, I, help, I find it helps boost appetite if you're struggling to gain weight. Many fruits have a reasonable-ish calorie density, so it's a way to get in some extra carbs. Uh, and they are a great source of micronutrients and flavonoids. Flavonoids are things that are unique to fruits that offer cool health benefits. So it's, it's cool. You can look up any fruit you like. You can look up uh, XYZ health benefits, and you can find the cool little properties, the flavonoids you unique to that uh, fruit have, whether it be anti-carcinogenic, whether it be uh, blood pressure reducing, whether it be cholesterol management. Lots of these things have cool little neat properties that are unique to them. I like the fructose space through the day. It's a very easy way to get in more micros. And most of all, this is a really uh, helpful tool for hitting that potassium macro. So you stop cramping up uh, as well as salting your meals. I like bananas, good micronutrient density, solid amount of potassium. It's not the most of any um, fruit or veggie, but it's very solid. Um, I tend to feel strong when I eat bananas. I am a massive banana advocate. If you hate them, don't eat them. Uh, blueberries and blackberries, both highly uh, dense in micronutrients, dense in antioxidants, just good options. Uh, they're relatively tasty. You could just eat a little, a cup of them with each meal. Uh, all around good for the digestion, good fiber source. It's just doing your homework, right? Yes, we could probably get pretty good results if we just kind of went with these first three categories, but we're going to promote our health, we're gonna promote our energy levels, and we're really just doing the things the right way if we include a little bit of fruit with each meal, in my personal opinion. Um, kiwis, phenomenal micronutrient density. Uh, pomegranates and cranberry. Um, cranberry, you've probably heard Stan Efferding advocate for it because it contains iodine, which is uh, very helpful for stimulating the metabolism and preventing goiter, which is good. Pomegranates have insane uh, antioxidant density. So a bit of a pain to eat these. So sometimes I would say, especially if it's someone who's struggling to gain weight, having uh, either pomegranate juice or cranberry juice is a way to get in some easy calories. Those same tips that people tell you to lose weight, which is like avoid liquid calories, can be reversed to help you gain weight. So get in some liquid calories. If you can drink milk, drink some milk. If you can maybe get your serving of fruit for one or two meals from juice because it's easier and we're already eating a ton of solid food, maybe it'd be hard to get down your fruit. You could get your oranges from orange juice, pomegranate juice, cranberry juice, all good options. Um, I would make sure that the juice you get is actually the uh, fruit that's on the label. Lots of things, are, it's cheaper to get like apple or pear juice and then flavor it a certain way. So make sure you read the label. Lots of cranberry juice is actually cranberry crop cocktail, which is flavored apple juice. Uh, so make sure it's actually cranberry juice. Make sure it's pomegranate juice. Most orange juice is orange juice. Should be good to go there. Um, let's see. Oranges, grapefruits are good for you. I believe they have a good... Uh, let's see, they've got good blood management uh, properties. I hear that they are good for uh, the management of high hematocrit. I hear that they are good for managing blood glucose in like pre-diabetic people. And I believe they have some positive impacts on cholesterol as well. So they don't taste great, but they offer a lot of cool benefits. So squeeze that in there if you want. Oranges, uh, tangerines, satsumas, all good options. Um, can't really complain about them. They checked that uh, option of getting in some micronutrients, getting in a little bit of fiber, uh, and getting in that bit of fructose to stimulate the liver periodically through the day. Um, yeah, fructose in high excesses might not be great, but there's a certain amount of fructose that the liver can handle quite comfortably. And it's, 
Uh, unless you're going out of your way to eat a shit ton of fruit, uh, it's almost hard to exceed that amount in nothing but fruit, especially if you're eating a lot of other fruit alongside it. Pineapple and papaya, pretty cool. Got decent-ish micros, uh, but they also contain digestive enzymes that are going to help you break down protein um, to help kind of promote speeding up that digestive process. So that's kind of a unique little perk to those. Strawberries, just a good option. Good potassium, good other stuff. Uh, and then cherries, I just think they're really easy to eat. I like cherries. The micronutrients is not outstanding on them, but they're not half bad. Make sure you wash them. Um, let's see. Now, we're going to get veggies next. Again, this is a matter of doing your homework and trying to, while we gain weight, make sure our health stays intact. Because we can get stronger as we gain weight. We can gain muscle as we gain weight. But we want to make this sustainable, right? We don't want it to be, yeah, I gained 20 pounds, but my health got gradually worse, and then I had to back off. Uh, if eating our veggies, keeping our... Um, fiber intake reasonably high can keep us healthful while gaining weight keep us feeling good hit our micros uh getting in that bit of fiber can aid in our digestion um it's it's just a matter of doing your homework could you get a 90 percent on this test if we just did those first four categories honestly probably right it's not as though veggies have these micronutrients that are absent from our micronutrient dense proteins and fruits right? It's not like there's something magical about them. So that's why a lot of bodybuilders, you actually won't see them eating many veggies because it'll leave them bloated. Um, but that being said, we're trying to do our homework here. Uh, you have the option of cooking a lot of veggies, which makes them quite a bit easier to digest. And I would recommend you do so if it's causing you gastric distress, but we're going to go through the veggies real quick. Do your homework, eat your veggies. If you've got a bowl of rice and meat, you owe it to yourself to at least mix in some veggies as well. That's kind of the basis of the big man diet is uh, if we're eating four or five meals a day, I would expect at least two of them to just be a bowl of rice, salt, some kind of protein, maybe an added fat, depending how lean the protein is, and then some veggie. You eat it uh, in just out of Tupperwares, out of bowls. That is, uh, <laughs> that is a disturbing amount of what getting bigger and stronger is, is sitting there eating bowls of meat and rice and veggies. So we're going to look um, at the top of the list. We have the cruciferous vegetables, right? The dark green veggies uh, are the ones that have the highest micronutrient densities. These are the heavy hitters. Uh, broccoli, kale, and spinach. I recommend probably cooking all three of these options to improve the ease of digestion. We kind of run some issues with like oxalates in the spinach and the kale and like maybe the broccoli. Um, which can upset your stomach. Uh, I believe the oxalate content is decreased if you cook it. Um, it can pose a risk of kidney stones. Again, this is decreased if you cook it. Uh, but these are the real heavy hitters in terms of giving you a ton of benefits. Um, the next one we're going to talk about is the potatoes and sweet potatoes. These are generally tracked as a carb source in my mind. I wouldn't say that, oh, I guess if you put your, you had your bowl, you had your meat, you have your rice, and you put some potatoes in there, Okay, you, you got your veggie for the meal. You, you get a pass. It's a tuber, but it is a veggie. Um, it's got the micronutrient density there. Fine. Um, but yeah, I guess that counts as a veggie. We got carrots, which just are there because they tend to be digestion friendly for just about everybody. Good source of fiber, uh, good source of vitamin A, good source of carotenoids, right? Uh I hope I'm saying that right. Man, I'm blanking here. It's been a while since I was in my nutrition class. So please bear with me if that one was uh, wrong. Now, next we've got beets. they got nitrates. They're good for blood pressure support. Reasonably good micro profile. If you like them, eat them. If you don't like them, don't force it. Uh, if you are trying to manage your blood pressure any way you can, beetroot powder is generally easier to get down if you don't like the beets themselves. Just mixing beetroot powder into your pre-workout or your intra-workout is a very good option. It can also help you get a better pump. Um, next one, bell peppers, great option easy on the digestion, good micronutrient profile, mushrooms, kind of the same story. Um, I really like the sugar snap peas uh, just because they require no prep. You can get a bag of sugar snap peas uh, from the grocery store. They taste okay. They don't taste bad at all. They're very easy to eat. They require no cooking. They don't require you to mix it into the meal. So if you're really lazy and you don't like eating your veggies in your big bowl of meat and rice, but uh, you're listening to little old Sam and you're like, ah, oh, shit, I got to check gotta check that box. I gotta eat veggies for this to be a complete meal. Literally, you could just go grab a handful of snap peas. It's very easy to eat. Uh, I would recommend it if you're just like kind of feeling really lazy about just this check that veggie box kind of deal. And the last one, celery. Uh, I think it's just, again, it's kind of easy to eat. You can put some peanut butter on it or something. Um, and while it is devoid of calories, it's not completely devoid of micronutrients. It's got fiber. You're going to get some of those benefits, especially if you like it. It's a good option. So this has been my list of kind of how to eat like a big man uh, or how to become a big man by eating more. Um, that would be my personal approach. Let me know if you guys have any questions. I'll be happy to answer them in the comments.